It is a familiar trope in film to have the villain of the story also be the protagonist. This is a powerful storytelling device as it allows us to empathize and root for characters we normally would not gravitate towards. Go away! And it also allows us to see things from a different perspective. I'm afraid. But also sometimes, it is just fun to go along for the ride with the bad guy. No, no, thank you. This storytelling device is blatantly obvious in the iconic films Joker, American Psycho, Beetlejuice, The Wolf on Wall Street, Despicable Me, and There Will Be Blood. But it also creeps into films in a subtle way as well, such as James Cameron's 1997 film Titanic. While the iceberg and the sinking of the ship made up a good chunk of the plot, there is also the love story of the protagonists, Rose and Jack. And while this is one of those once-in-a-lifetime love stories, it is also a woman recklessly cheating on her fiancé. Jack, I'm engaged. Two people engaging in public fornication, and the male lead is a penniless bum that gambled his way onto the ship. When you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. Poor Cal Hockley, the fiancé, is portrayed as the villain for wanting to give Rose a life of luxury. <laughs> Perhaps as a reminder of my feelings for you. Protect her from the poverty-stricken dredges of society made you think that you could put your hands on my fiance and expecting her to respect their engagement not without you the star wars film saga like the many great films mentioned also uses this form of storytelling it tells the story from the perspective of a rebel military resistance fighters and religious minority that engage in violent coups against the respective benevolent governments of the time it's treason then through all of these films, the slant is just enough where you want to cheer on the rebels, resistance, and Jedi. Yeah. <laughs> but there is just enough evidence to show that these factions are not the moral pillars they project themselves to be. This guy right here, it's because he cheats. And now that the saga has concluded, and the evidence is out there for all to see, this is The First Order Was Right. Our initial encounter with The First Order is at the beginning of The Force Awakens. To my shock and dismay, a lot of people take umbrage with how Phasma and Kylo Ren ended the encounter. So, the villagers. Kill them all. But what led to these events? Poe went to Jakku to meet with Lor Santeca to get information to destroy the First Order. The General's been after this for a long time. The First Order soon arrives, as would be expected by any responsible government that strives for peace and security in its dominion. And as would be expected by lawless insurrectionists, Poe and Lorsan devise plans to escape. You have to hide. You have to leave. And also pay close attention to the warning bells going off in this community. Go. As would be expected from these lawless desperados, the whole village gathers arms that are used to recklessly and preemptively fire upon the First Order peacekeepers as they land. <laughs> Poe, as the coward that he is, runs back to his X-Wing, and uses it to brutally murder two stormtroopers that came to humanely apprehend him. Like literally, this brave soul was killed by these villagers as they initiated unprovoked hostilities. So while any loss of life is a shame, this village as a whole engaged in treason against the First Order, unprovoked hostilities, and murder of peacekeeping forces. For the sake of safety of the galaxy, I do not see how euthanizing this callous village is too bad in the scheme of things. But before moving on to the next topic, after all the destruction that was invariably caused by Poe Dameron being on Jakku, he is peacefully apprehended. Additionally, as would be expected by someone as respectable as Kylo Ren, he still cannot avoid complimenting Poe and trying to accommodate his needs. I had no idea we had the best pilot in the Resistance on board. Comfortable? Moving on to the next topic, when talking about the First Order, it is equally important to talk about the New Republic and the Resistance. Automatically, something strikes me as odd about this whole setup. I need you in command with me. Thank you. I appreciate that. General? General. The Republic and Resistance aren't cahoots with each other. The government that supports the Resistance. The Republic. Why would the Republic be aligned with an independent military like the Resistance? Because it is made very clear that the Republic does have its own military. My, without the Republic fleet, we're doomed. Okay. We'll bring an end to that cherished fleet. Moreover, if the First Order is supposedly so unpopular, how are the Resistance and New Republic so small? Like, literally, they are quite small. The Republic only seems to be in the Husnia system, and upon its destruction, there is not much more attention paid to the Republic at all in the films. Regarding the Resistance, these haphazard barbarians are nothing more than a handful of ships. 
After the Dreadnought battle in The Last Jedi, the Resistance fleet is even fewer ships. And later on in the same film, the Resistance then goes on to be just enough people to fit into the Millennium Falcon. And of course, this was after they sent out pleas for help. That's a rebel base? Abandoned, but heavily armored, with enough power to get a distress signal to our allies scattered in the outer rim. I can reasonably assume that when Poe and Finn designated Lando to go to the core systems, it was because they knew he would be dishonest in his claims. He'll take the Falcon to the core systems. Send out a call for help for anybody listening. Lando's history of being a liar and cheat is all the proof one needs to know that he made less than honest promises when gathering these ships to fight on Exegol. Full a buck. Yeah, that's right. Lando Calrissian. This card player, gambler, scoundrel. You'd like him. Mining colony? Yeah, Tabana gas mine. Lando conned somebody out of it. Did you trust him? No. I don't trust Lando. Well, I don't trust him either. You know, I know what she means to me. I'll take good care of her. She, she won't get a scratch. 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 Heck, when asked how he helped destroy the Empire in the last war, he mentions Han. Luke, Han, Leia, me. Who's ever ready? How'd you do it? Defeat an empire with almost nothing. We had each other. Even though Han didn't do much because Lando was the one that got Han frozen. Yes, he's alive. And the one mission that they did after Han was thought out, aka the cold-blooded attack on the second Death Star that was filled with countless innocent construction workers that were trying to put food on the tables of their families. Whew. This mission involved Luke, Leia, Han, and Lando not even being together. But moving on to the philosophical justification of the First Order. Palpatine was very clear that his goal with the Empire was to bring peace. For a safe and secure society. The Separatists have been taking care of my master. You have restored peace and justice to the galaxy. And we shall have peace. As is common knowledge, the Empire was unsuccessful. Yes, it brought peace to many parts of the galaxy, but it was never able to squash the masochistic rebellion. The rebellion, which never actually stated a reason as to why the Empire was bad, the Empire may be gracious at all. Thank you. Engaged in wanton and unprovoked attacks that destroyed the two peacekeeping Death Stars. You must use the information in this R2 unit to help plan the attack. Quick side note. Besides being blinded by violence with no clear justification, the Rebellion gave up some golden opportunities to turn the tide in their favor, most notably letting this little piece of research go unused by them while raiding the archives on Scarif. Hyperspace tracking, hyperspace tracking, hyperspace tracking. They've tracked us through light speed. That's impossible. Yes. And they've done it. But back to the point. The First Order rose from the ashes of the Empire when it was decimated by the Heartless Blitz on the second Death Star. It is literally in the name. The First Order brought order to the galaxy. But there is more to this argument. As I stated in the beginning, we are told the story primarily from the perspective of the Jedi and Resistance. We are not exposed to the countless worlds living in peace under the First Order. I'm not saying they are perfect. No organization or person is perfect. But the leadership of the First Order under Supreme Leader Snoke and to a lesser extent, Palpatine in the shadows. I have been every voice you have ever heard inside your head. Is an almost perfect analogy to America's greatest president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. FDR did many wonderful things, like unite a crippled nation that was suffering through the Great Depression by passing the New Deal, creating Social Security, kicking Nazi butt as a wartime president, and funding the creation of weapons of mass destruction that led to a major drop in deaths from war that we are still benefiting from today. Snoke very much did the same things. He built up the First Order out of the ashes of the Empire. He defended the galaxy against both the Resistance and Republic forces. He put many people to work. And he also instituted the creation of weapons of mass destruction with the Starkiller base. As great as these leaders were, they were not perfect. FDR did not support the passage of a law that would outlaw lynching, and Snoke avoided good self-care by not using moisturizer. 
But the point I'm trying to make is that even the best of people will still have their enemies. Heck, the fundamental part of the story of Jesus and Christianity is that a bunch of people wanted him dead. If Jesus can have enemies, great leaders like Snoke and Palpatine will also have enemies. The same argument has to be made for the First Order as an organization. It isn't perfect, but it is generally good. The First Order united a divided galaxy to the point where no one, and I mean literally no one, wanted to oppose them. Our distress signal has been received at multiple points, but no response. They've heard us, but no one's coming. The same is true about the beacon of the world, America. It isn't perfect, but it is overall good. It is undefeated in successfully spreading freedom to all the nations where it did so successfully. It illuminated the world by being the place where the light bulb was invented. It connected the world by inventing the telephone, cell phone, and iPhone. It is also the home of the McRib. And many happy couples all throughout the world can thank America for being the birthplace of ass to mouth. Likewise, the First Order is the beacon of the galaxy. It offers ever-present security. There's always random First Order patrols in crowds like these. The First Order also corrected the problems of the Republic. Today is the end of the Republic. The end of a regime that acquiesces to disorder. At this very moment, in a system far from here, the new Republic lies to the galaxy! While the Resistance uses brute force to attack their enemies... Hit the target dead center as many runs as we can get! Ah, direct hit! <laughs> but no damage! Yeah, we gotta keep hitting it! Another bombing run! The First Order uses logic and tactics to defeat their enemies. Keep up the barrage. Let's at least remind them that we're still here. Very good, sir. They won't last long burning fuel like this. It's just a matter of time. Now to extrapolate on what was just glossed over, the First Order using weapons of mass destruction is a brilliant method to bring and ensure peace in the galaxy. I have taken flack for this in the past, but the evidence doesn't lie. Weapons of mass destruction are weapons of peace. When you look at total casualties from war, which is the sum of civilians and soldiers, it can be seen that the peak of global deaths from war was in the 1940s, where 200 people per 100,000 were dying as a result of war. Even though that was during World War II and the deadliest conflict in human history, there's been a steady drop in the rate of deaths from war since then. Right now, the global death rate from war is 2 per 100,000, an all-time low. Additionally, the great powers of the world, in which all except Germany have nuclear weapons, for the first time have not engaged in conflict with each other longer than a decade, where the current trend is longer than 30 years. This is obviously directly correlated to the existence of nuclear weapons. The reasoning behind this is simple. No one wants to go to war if the casualties will be high or if only a few bombs can cripple a nation. Palpatine said it best. Hell, we shall have peace. So the First Order making Starkiller base was a plan to lead to peace. As no other system would want to violently oppose the First Order. We sent out a call for help at the Battle of Crate. Nobody came. Let me reiterate, there is zero reputable evidence to suggest that the First Order was not a wonderful government to live under. This is probably where I expect some people would want to comment with such lines like Patrick Henry's Give me liberty or give me death. This 18th century beta cuck of a keyboard warrior was all talk and did not fight for American independence or lift anything more than ink to paper when it came to actually fighting for freedom. Which all comes back to the basic fact that there is no evidence of known atrocities committed by the First Order against civilians. Palpatine making the fleet of planet-killing Star Destroyers is a further example of how these were tools for peace. Yeah, it sucks that Kajimi was blown up, but all evidence shows that it was a criminal stronghold for spice runners. Oh, funny he never mentioned mm -hmm. it. Your friend's old job was running spice. We were a spice runner? And abusive parents, as the First Order came and saved all the kids from these abusive households. First Order took most of the kids a long time ago. Speaking of the First Order and children, we often overlook how great the First Order was for the children. In many parts of our world, it is incredibly difficult or hard for Child Protective Services to step in and save a child. But the First Order seemed to be very adept at this. They were so well suited that they were able to step in and save Finn before he could even be old enough to remember the trauma of his life under his parents. I was taken from a family I'll never know. And let us not forget the wonderful education that came along with this. In the real world, it is a sign of prestige to send your kids to an expensive military school. 
but the children of the First Order got it for free. Of the two characters we meet that speak poorly of this matter are Janna and Finn. Okay, wait. You were First Order? Not by choice. And it doesn't take long to see one glaring shared detail about them that shows why they wouldn't like such an experience. Hmm, you notice it yet? They were deserters. Deserters? All of us here were stormtroopers. Even as peace was all but assured under the final order, this selfless officer knew that more children could be saved from their abusive households. We'll need to harvest more of a galaxy's young. Now please excuse me while I go off on a tangent. I know this video is about the First Order, but I have to talk about Alderaan. It was very clearly shown as a sparsely populated planet. There was no noticeable spacecraft, and the capital city where Bail Organa lives is literally just a few buildings. Even Obi-Wan, granted I wouldn't call him a reputable source, referenced the population as millions. As if millions of voices suddenly cried out in... So as this video is based on the films, the population of Alderaan was very sparse and was a perfect example to minimize the loss of life while still targeting an enemy of the Empire while showcasing the power of the Death Star to the galaxy. Now some of you tightly wound laser brain dweebs may be blowing a gasket saying a simple Google search, reading the lore, or watching Rebels would show that Alderaan had a population of 2 billion people. Maybe it would, but I don't want to use a children's show as a reference. Oh, that shooting. I think you boys need a little more time on the practice range. And while I probably would have enjoyed reading the comics, I was too busy during the past 20 years playing a good old-fashioned game with my hips called Make Your Mom Squeal Like Chewbacca. <laughs> like literally, if you are between the ages of 4 to 20, are the only fat person in your family, and have a lightsaber the size of a tauntaun, then I am probably your father. And I'm not talking about your run-of-the-mill, above-average lightsaber. I am talking so big that even compensating for body fat, it still dangles in the water when you drop a Yoda. Seriously, son, I would love to meet you. It is a simple two-step process to ask your mom. Step one, ask your mom if she remembers Jim Hoos. Step two, ask her if my midichlorians are still dripping out of her bits after all these years. There's an awful lot of moisture in here. If she says yes, then welcome to the family. I am your father. And yes, I know you are my son, because I only produce winners that earn 100% of the dollar. I should apologize to the women watching this, but according to the data, there aren't any watching. But back to the topic at hand. On a more micro level, let's look at how the two main members of the rival factions deal with stress. Moral pillar Kylo Ren, when he is stressed, he takes it out on inanimate objects. Helped in the escape. <laughs> which by the way, creates job security for the maintenance team. While Rey, the Jakku bandit, takes out her frustrations on living trees depriving the environment of life-giving oxygen. She even crushes her nefarious globular lackey. I'm so sorry. Really though, the argument all comes down to family values. Palpatine was all about reuniting with his granddaughter. Long have I waited for my grandchild to come home. I never wanted you dead. I wanted you here. And this was after years spent trying to get Vader to reunite with his son. He would become a powerful ally. While on the other side, things could not be more of a mess. Luke abandons his sister. Ever since Luke disappeared, people have been looking for him. Leia refuses to support her son. You can't go back to him now. Like, I can't. Leia also defies God's covenant by divorcing her husband. And lest we not forget, Luke tried to kill his nephew. And the last thing I saw were the eyes of a frightened boy whose master had failed him. Really, when you think about it, Kylo Ren wasn't necessarily in the wrong when it came to killing Han Solo. Yeah, it was his dad but his dad had the blood of millions of men and women on his hands. Also, Kylo Ren should be pretty mad that his parents named him Ben, after Obi-Wan, a.k.a. Ben Kenobi. Obi-Wan Kenobi. I wonder if he means old Ben Kenobi. Old Ben lives out beyond the Dune Sea. He's kind of a strange old hermit. Let's look at this. Leia never met Obi-Wan. Han knew Obi-Wan for like two days, and Luke knew the living version of him for only a few hours longer than Han. 
I, at least, would be pretty mad if I was named after a dead guy that only one of my parents knew for as long as a weekend that waited until after my mom and uncle made out tell my uncle that the metal bikini goddess was his sister. Leia is my sister. Your insight serves you well. Throughout this video, I kept talking about evidence, and how without evidence, certain claims against the First Order could not be verified. In the films, there is one stain on the squeaky clean countertop that is the First Order, and that is Rose's description of her home. The First Order stripped our ore to finance their military, then shelled us to test their weapons. While this story pulls at the heartstrings, it is categorically false. To shell something means that a projectile or solid munition is used. However, the First Order only uses energy-based weapons. I am hopeful that an eternity roasting in hell is long enough for Rose to learn how to tell an honest story. As I round out this video, I will leave you with a montage showcasing the contradictory methods of encounter between the First Order and the Resistance. The cold-blooded violence of the Resistance is even more obvious when paired directly next to the mercy of the First Order as it peacefully apprehends its adversaries. Don't move! TK338, we have targets in custody! <laughs> Try that. Thanks for watching and please hit that subscribe button. My next video coming out is a documentary about how comic books dominated the cinema. Please follow me on my socials where you can get information about future uploads as well as my new podcast that's starting soon.